Well, hello. Welcome to Vaughn Forest. It's great to see so many of you here on our campus. I got to be honest, after the 930, I was wondering what was going on. It was a little sparse in there. So y'all slept in. It's okay. It's good to see you. Glad you made it to church today. Hey, if you're new, if it's your first time, if we haven't met, my name's Adam, one of the pastors here. Glad you're here. I also want to welcome everybody joining us online. I know we have folks that continue to join us online every single week, and we are so glad that you are joining us as well. So we're kicking off a new series. It's always a fun Sunday. We're kicking off a new series, kind of shifting gears, talking about something new. And we're going to talk about worship for the next five weeks. And the title of the series is Then Sings My Soul. And uh, that is a direct pull from one of my favorite worship songs, How Great Thou Art, which we're going to sing um, together at the end of our time today. So I'm excited to kick this message off with you. There are some message notes in your bulletins. Let me ask you to go ahead and find those. Those of you here on our campus, get those ready. We're eventually going to get to three kind of practical application points. I'm going to ask you to jot down. Uh, we'll have a lot of things we're going to cover before that. If you're joining us online, uh, you can find those message notes inside uh, your Vaughn Forest Church app, or you can access them right here at vaughnforest.com. But let me just say real quick, thank you for Friday night. Um, those of you who came out, we had our married couples event. Uh, I think we had 75 or 80 couples that are up here, and it was so much fun. So I just want to say thank you again to the couples who are on our panel. We had Chad and Christy Boak, Rodney and Janice Hall, Brad and Beth Long, and Morgan and I left that evening just so encouraged and so grateful for all of you and so grateful to have our Vaughn Forest family. And man, it was just a lot of fun. So thank you to all of you who were able to come out. Thank you to everybody who took care of all the kids. Uh, we had a whole team that was doing child care while we were enjoying the meal and enjoying a good fellowship with one another. So just thank you for a great evening. So let me tell you where we're going to start today. I'm going to ask you a question, all right? So the title of today's message is quite simply a question, where's your worship. And hopefully by the end of our time together today, that question will make sense. And hopefully by the end of our time together today, you'll know the answer to that question. So we're going to be in this series for five weeks. We're going to start here today. I'm going to ask a question to kind of get us off and running. But let me kind of give you a preview of where we're going to go each Sunday in this series. So it's five weeks. Next Sunday, we're going to come back, and the title is Worship's Starting Point, which would make sense for that to be the title today since we're starting the message series today. But today's message is almost a precursor to Worship's Starting Point. So next week's really kind of the start, but we'll just kind of you know, let that one slide, okay? So Worship Worship's starting point. And then two weeks from today, worship as music throughout the generations. That's going to be a really fun message. So we're going to talk about this. Worship just isn't music, but clearly music is a big part of it. So we're going to go back to the book of Psalms. Like, why, why is music such a big deal to God? And why are all of these psalms about music in the Bible? And then what does that look like in the New Testament? Why is it that the early church, one of the things they were known for was singing? And then you look throughout church history and the development of that. And then you get to this time period where all these amazing hymns that were written. And what was going on in the time period that many of these hymns were written to address. And then you get to the 20th century and into the 21st century, and there's a shift with a lot of different genres of worship music that are being written. How, how does all of that fit together? Why does that matter? And I think it's going to be a really fun message. And then you see on November 13th, worship as sacrifice. If there's one word that worship is synonymous with in both the Old and New Testament, it's sacrifice. So we're going to talk about what that means biblically, and then we're going to talk about how does that translate to our lives practically. What, what does that look like for us today to live out worship as sacrifice? And then finally, Sunday, November 20th, which is the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Can y'all believe that? This year is flying by. Worship as all of life Worship that ultimately that's what we're called to. As Christ followers, everything about our life is to be worship. And so it's going to be a, a really fun series, and really more so than any other message series I can think of in recent memory. This is one sermon spread out over five weeks. So a lot of times we talk about here at Vaughn Forest, we don't preach in sermons, we preach in series. That's really true for this message series. So they're all going to kind of tie together. We're going to pick up one week where we left off with the others. So let me challenge you up top to be a part of this message series. Obviously, if you're here in town locally, we'd love for you to be on our campus, 9, 30, or 11. If you're traveling or if one of your kids gets sick and you can't be here, we get that. We have a lot, large community that joins us online every single week, and you can obviously take part in that as well. But I think on the other side of this series, there's an opportunity for all of us to have grown in our faith as it pertains to 
worship. So grab those message notes, and I'm going to give you a couple things I want you to jot down that are not fill-ins. I want you to just kind of jot it down in the margin. And let me give you a quick little reminder. And then also, for those of you maybe who are new to Vaughn Forest, the message notes are, are for you. So the reason why we give you message notes is because study after study after study shows that if you write something down, you're more likely to remember it. And then we know that if you're more likely to remember something, you're more likely then to put it into practice. And that's the goal. The goal of these sermons is that we put into practice what God's Word says. And so the message notes are really a spiritual growth tool. And, and we really try hard here at Vaughn Forest. We don't always get this right, but we try hard to give you as many tools for spiritual growth as possible. One of those other tools that we have is um, our The Other Six podcast. And so if you're new to Vaughn Forest, we're about 60 episodes in. Matt, Chad, me, every week we talk all things spiritual growth for the other six days of the week. And, and some of you have said, man, that's been super helpful in my walk with the Lord. And so we're constantly trying to just give you some tools that will help Help you in your faith and help you to walk with the Lord. Okay, so the message notes are part of that. So let me give you kind of three foundational truths about worship that I want you to jot down. These are not fill-ins, but you definitely want to kind of have them jotted down somewhere. We'll leave it up here for a second to give you some time. We all worship. Worship happens everywhere. Worship is our response to something we value. So let's talk about what I mean by that. First message of a five-week series, what I'm going to try to do is separate for a moment this idea that worship is what happens in this room, or worship is what happens at church, or even worship is what Christians do. One of the goals that I want you to see for the message today is we're actually all wired for worship. Every creature, every person, there's lots of things in the Bible about nature and the rocks crying out that if we're not going to worship God, the rocks will do it for us. God created all of us to worship. We are all worshipers at heart. And if there's a word that I could say, think every time you hear worship, that word is response. That its core worship is a response. That there's something else that initiates my response of worship. It might be a person, it might be a thing, it might be an idea, it might be an experience, but, but there's some type of response that happens in me, and what I'm saying is that is actually, from God's Word, a way for us to look at worship. Second, worship happens everywhere, from everyone, not just Christ followers. I can remember when we lived out in Colorado. So, you know, just surrounded by the Rocky Mountains. I mean, it's amazing. It's just beautiful. Like, you're driving to the grocery store. You got to make sure you don't wreck your car because you'll just start looking at the mountains. It's just all around you. And when we lived out there, you know, Morgan and I were constantly just talking about, look at this. Isn't our God amazing? I mean, we would look at those mountains and immediately we would just think, God is incredible. Isn't God creative? Isn't this amazing? There's so much fun to ski on these things and hike on these. And it's just awesome. These mountains are incredible. And with our boys, we look at this and we're drawing their attention to God because we believe God created everything. And we had a lot of friends out there that were not Christ followers. And you know, you meet them through different avenues in the neighborhood or on the ball field. And, and, and a lot of our friends out there that weren't Christ followers would acknowledge the same mountains. Wow, these are amazing mountains. But they didn't steer their response towards God. They steered their response towards the mountains. So it's almost a worship of nature. There was still a response that was being generated in them. It just wasn't being directed towards God, because see, ultimately, the third point there, the third, the third truth there, is that worship is our response to something we value. That if you want to see what you value in your life, just kind of see what's actually dictating your response. And so what I want us to do today is really just start to unpack that and really right-size that and really understand that. So let's just kind of take this a step further and let's just talk about some different examples. All right, let me give you an example from my life where some worship took place. Maybe kind of hard to tell what this is or this picture because it's kind of an aerial shot. But this picture was taken on May 20th, 2000. And this is Shelby Farms, Tennessee, right outside Memphis. And this was called One Day. And it was a gathering organized by Louis Giglio. And it was for college students. And we think that the estimates are like 80 or 90,000 college students there. And I was about to graduate from college in East Tennessee, so me and a bunch of buddies, we just headed west, and we went, and it was a day of worship, it was a day of prayer, it was a day of fasting. Now, we had to sleep in the woods the night before in a tent um, when we got there, and then we had this day where this picture 
was taken. And clearly, it was an opportunity for a generation to come together and worship God. And it's one of those kind of stake-in-the-ground moments for me in my life. I'm so grateful that I was there. And, and, and it was a generation saying, hey, God, our yes is on the table. Wh whatever you want to do with our lives, let's go. And let's make a difference for such a time as this. And, and it was incredible. And, and, and to, to be worshiping God with, with that many college students was significant. And, and what's been really cool is, is that kind of launched this whole movement. And so uh, Louie now pastors a church in Atlanta called Passion City Church. And now they do passion conferences every year. They don't do a, a one-day gathering on a farm. But these passion conferences have grown so much. And you may not know this. That's why I'm telling you this, that every year, the first week of January, they do this passion conference now at Mercedes-Benz Stadium like where they play the SEC championship game. So if you want to be super encouraged, don't do this right now. I'd prefer you listen to me right now. But if you want to be super encouraged, go on YouTube sometime today and just type Passion Gathering Mercedes-Benz and prepare to be encouraged for the next 20 to 30 minutes as you watch 70, 75,000 college students worshiping God. Now, they get to do it in Mercedes-Benz. We were in the mud on a farm, so it's a little different now, okay? So you're welcome, college students, today. Like, we paved the way for you, but, but they're doing that, and they're worshiping. And clearly, what happens when we gather churches, that's kind of supposed to be our response. We recognize who we're worshiping. We recognize who we value and, 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 it, and it generates this response in us. And sometimes when, when I get a little discouraged, like, I, I, I mean, I'll for real, like, I'll get on YouTube and I'll start searching some of these things and I'll, and I'll be reminded, wow, we get to do this with each other. We get to worship. But see, you don't have to be a Christ follower to understand that idea that when you get together with people and something good is happening, you're fired up about it. Like, it's going to generate a response in you. So let me give you another picture that we kind of see this happen in our culture, and it's through concerts. And I, I just picked one concert. I'm, this is a U2 concert. I can't remember where it was at, but apparently this picture was taken 8 minutes and 43 seconds before the concert started. I don't know if you can see that from where you're sitting, or it was 8.43 p.m. That's neither here nor there. But these are tens of thousands of people who have gathered together, and, and they are going to have an experience together. And I would venture to suggest that a lot of times in concerts, what you can observe is a more accurate description of what God's Word defines worship as. People who are being moved, people who are responding to an experience, to a song, to togetherness, not necessarily towards God, but there's just something in them that's responding. Now, what's interesting is even when people are gathering, and the reason they're gathering isn't for God, if a Christ follower is present, Sometimes they can begin to point out that this thing that's happening in us is actually at a much deep rooted, much more deeply rooted place than just kind of why we're here. So again, I can't show you this clip because YouTube would shut us down. They'd get upset with churches when you showed their stuff or whatever, and they shut you down, and you can't do the online broadcast, so I don't want to risk that. So again, you could find this on your own time. I think it was 2005. I'm not sure what year it was, 2007, sometimes in the 2000s. It was a YouTube concert at the Rose Bowl. So all of us college football fans are the Rose Bowl, the granddaddy of them all. And I mean, 100,000 people are at this concert. And, and the clip, I, I found it this week, I watched it, is in between songs, Bono just kind of spontaneously started singing Amazing Grace. And 100,000 people joined him singing Amazing Grace. And for many of these folks, it was probably the first time they had ever sang that song. So in that moment, there's at least for some of them an awareness, like they're, there's something driving my response. I didn't come here tonight to sing Amazing Grace. I may not even theologically believe that, but I am participating now. It was happening there. Well, there's something in us that begins to respond when something of value begins to take place. And then obviously, we understand this here in the South. I had to use the University of Georgia, right? But you know, you cannot walk with God and this could be your team, all right? But I just use my team, all right? But we get that. You fill up stadiums for Auburn or Alabama or Georgia, even places like South Carolina, God bless them, right? So that can happen sometimes, right? Well, what's happening there? Good things happen. We're doing this together. We're responding. Yeah. And so you're like, is that worship? Am I sinning? No, we're actually going to talk about that on the podcast. Like, how do we kind of clarify some distinctions with that? But what I'm just trying to do is get the wheels turning to help us see that really all of life somewhere in us, nobody ever had to teach us how to do this, that, that we actually worship. So if the question for today is, where is your worship? What I want to spend the rest of our time doing is helping you find your worship. 
So how do you find your worship? Like, I didn't know it was lost. I knew I was supposed to be looking for it, okay? But I, but I hope that by the time we get to the end of this, you'll say, wow, th there's actually some value to this. And you may have already noticed we've got some communion stations set up here in the room. There's some down front, there's some in the middle, there's some in the back. So where we're going with all this is in the time of our response today, where our worship team's gonna come out, they're gonna lead us in How Great Thou Art. They're gonna lead us in another song. You're gonna have the opportunity to partake of communion while we respond in worship. But before we get to that, let me do a little bit of a diagnosis. And this is an ongoing diagnosis. This is not a one-time message diagnosis. How do I find my worship? This is a daily, hey, Lord, reveal to me where my worship is. So I've got three points that I want you to jot down, and we'll look at what God's Word has to say about them. So here's the first way to find your worship. Recognize that I am pre-wired to worship God. I just want you to see that. The reason why we worship is because God wired us that way. It's actually part of who you are. It's an inescapable truth. For all of human history, for every culture, this is not continent specific. This is not cultural specific. This is not language specific. If you're a person, you've been pre-wired for worship. Now, why is that? So let's look at God's word and talk about that. I've got some verses I'm gonna share with you. All the way back to the beginning, Genesis 1, Then God said, let us make mankind, both man and woman, in our image, in our likeness. We've drawn attention to this before. Let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That the Trinity was in existence from the beginning. Jesus doesn't show up for the first time at the first Christmas. Jesus has always existed. Now, Jesus did show up through the incarnation, becoming one of us, born of the Virgin at the first Christmas that we obviously celebrate every year. But God said, let us make man, woman, mankind in our image. Here's why you are pre-wired for worship. You are created in God's image. You are an image bearer of God. You're created in the likeness of God. And church, that's true for everyone. The reason why every person on this planet has value is because they're an image bearer of God. You may disagree with an individual. You may not see things the same way. You, you may be opposed in a number of different areas, but that individual still has worth and still has value. There are no mistakes. Everybody's life counts. Everybody's life matters. Everybody's life has purpose. And here's why, created in the image of God. Now look at what Colossians says about this. We did an entire series in Colossians called Implications. Colossians 1.16. All things have been created through him and for him. So now we're talking back about creation. We talked about in the Colossians series. God the Father, role in creation. God the Son, role in creation. God the Holy Spirit, role in creation. So all of this is being created through him, created by him. But then here's what's interesting, created for him that you were created for God. And if you were created for God, and if you were created in the image of God, and you have been pre-wired to worship God, here's what God knows about you. The best way that you get through this thing called life is by connecting and having communion and having worship with God, your heavenly Father, that you were literally created for God's pleasure. God takes delight in you. God takes delight in our worship. We've actually been created for him. And then finally, let me give you the third verse about this. This is the appropriate response because of the truths that we're talking about. David got it right. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Pri foundationally, why are we worshiping God? Because he fearfully and wonderfully made us in his image, created for him. So I really can't think of anything worth worshiping God about. Here's the answer. You were created. Here's the answer. You're an image bearer and the likeness of God created for him. That is the foundational reason why we then respond in worship. It's because God has done this. And what does David say? Your works are wonderful and we know this. And so I can't really see God doing any kind of good work in my life right now. I've been there. That doesn't mean you're always gonna be able to see what God is up to right now. And so you have to rely on what God has done in the past. So honestly, man, I can't really see a whole lot of good things that God's done in the past. I hear you. That's why God gave us his word. Now, it's not the only reason, but it sure is a great benefit that you can look into God's word and say, wow, God can be trusted. God's faithfulness has been proven over and over and over. So we are pre-wired to worship God. And one of the enemy's strategies is to play on that. 
and begin to redirect our worship away from something other than God, which leads us to our second point for finding our worship. How do you do that? Honestly assess where I'm focusing my worship. And it's an honest assessment. Where is my worship going? If Satan knows that you are created to worship God, pre-wired, image bearer, likeness, fearfully and wonderfully made, his strategy for your life is going to be to redirect your worship away from God, your heavenly Father, away from God, your creator. And part of what it means to be a Christ follower is to consistently assess where is my worship actually going? Where am I focusing my worship? So let me give you a a, a key sin that has happened for all of human history. From Romans chapter 1, it can be applied in biblical times, it can be applied in the last 2,000 years, and it can be applied today. They exchanged, who's they? People. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. So rather than worshiping the creator, here's Satan's subtle strategy for your life. Just worship created things. It might be a tangible thing. It might be an idea. It might be a different value. That if God is ultimately the creator of all things, and if all things were created by him, through him, and for him, and if we're going to worship, and there's not a switch that Satan can flip and make everybody stop worshiping, all he's going to do is shift your worship away from the creator towards created things. And Satan's not real creative. He's used this same strategy over and over and over. He's just incredibly persistent. So how do you do an honest assessment? How do you begin to see, is this actually happening in my life? So let me give you a little checklist. Again, I didn't put this in your notes. It's a very helpful checklist. This is a checklist I use in my life, okay? Your time, your affection, your energy, your money, and your allegiance will reveal who or what you worship. So we'll leave this up here for a second if you want to jot it down somewhere. So I'm worshiping God all is well. You know, I'm not sure why we're doing a five-week series on worship. I think things are going pretty good in my life, okay? Well, let's do an honest assessment. Where's your time going? Where's your affection? Where's your energy, your money, your allegiance? Think about it this way. I like to hike, okay? So I like hiking on a trail, and eventually you get to the end of the trail, and you know, maybe it's the top of a mountain or just, you know, it's just like a, a post that lets you know you finished. Now you got to turn around and go back down. And so, you know, that's, that's how this works, okay? So if I were to follow the trail of your time, where would it eventually lead me? If I were to follow the trail of your affection, if I were to follow the trail of your energy, if someone were to follow the trail of my money, if I were to follow the trail of your allegiance, where does that trail ultimately lead you, lead me? lead us. And here's the hard truth, church. If it leads us to anyone or anything other than God, we may have some misguided worship. There's nothing wrong with having affection towards other things or energy towards other things. But if they have taken the place of the primary seat and the throne of your life, I would suggest you might be worshiping them. And an honest assessment when it comes to these things matters. Why? You were created for God. And any time you take something other than God and you place it in the seat of the throne of your life, and that becomes the center of your worship, something in your life is always going to feel off because it does not match the pre-wiring that God put into you as an image bearer of Him. So when you do an honest assessment and you find There's something else there. What do you do? And that's the third step for today for finding your worship, finding my worship. Confess if an idol has become a source of worship. You confess. Hey, if you follow that trail and you find anything other than God, what do you do? Do you just kind of ignore it? Do you make an excuse for it? Do you hope it goes away? Do you act like it's not a big deal? Do you wait for the next sermon series? Like, what do you do? Here's what I'm suggesting. Confess it. Just confess it. Confession is such a loaded word in our culture. New Testament, the word confess, all it means is agree. Hey, God, I followed the trail of my money. Let me tell you what I found. Something other than you. I agree with that assessment. God, I want to confess that. I want to repent from that. And I want to go a new way. You confess. And the word that the Bible uses is idol. 
And that's kind of some strong language because you think idol, isn't that in the Old Testament like statues? They built like a cow out of gold. They would worship it and God would say, stop doing that. And then they'd go worship another idol. God say, stop doing that. And you're on to something there. In the Old Testament, over and over, you see people, they're worshiping tangible. You can touch it, see it, smell it. I don't know if that is smell, but like it's there. And they're worshiping this idol. But when you get to the New Testament, when we see idol worship, it moves away from the tangible to what's actually going on inside our heart. So let's go back to Colossians and see where God's Word says this. Colossians 3, 5, and 6. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. This is Paul's way of saying, hey, you had a sin nature. You were born again. We talked about this in our last series. Paul would say you are now in Christ. You've experienced salvation. But you still have this old sin nature. This, here Paul calls it an earthly nature. Last week he called it your old self. Now here's why that matters, because that old self, that earthly nature, can actually still drive desires. So Paul says, put it to death. Whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. So any desire that looks more like your old self than what should be emblematic or representative of a Christ follower is an evil desire. Put that to death because it is serving to be an idol in your life. And then here's the way the verse ends. ends. Hey, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. So what does that mean? Let me tell you what it means. God takes these things very seriously. God takes our worship seriously. So my question for you today is quite simply, where's your worship? Is there something in your life that is driving your affections, your emotions, your love, your focus, your money, your allegiance, other than God? And this can be so subtle. I mean, it could be prestige, popularity, position. It can be a season of life. You're just consumed with the season of life. Like, I'm in this season, but I want to be in that season. And it drives everything about you, your emotions and everything else. It can be a relationship. This one's hard. But, but, but the enemy is subtle. He's not going to show up and announce his arrival in your life. But if the enemy can, can take a relationship that, that matters to you and somehow move that into the primary seat of your life, now your worship is off. It can happen in a marriage. Your spouse can, can be seated and a seat that's not their seat. It's God's seat. Hey, parents, you can do that with your kids. I know that's tough to hear. But if we're not careful, kids can very quickly become idols. See, what the enemy likes to do in our lives is take good things and try to turn them into God things. And if the enemy can take a good thing and turn it into a God thing, the result for you is a very bad thing. And it's so subtle. He's not getting you to to chase down or or pursue the evils of the world, he's just got your worship off. He's just got something other than God dictating emotions, affection, allegiance, money, time, talent, treasure, and you feel off. Might I suggest it's because God is not seated in the primary seat in the throne of your life. And we're gonna go into a time of communion here in just a moment. And the reason I wanted to do that today is because communion is a reminder of what Jesus did for us. And when Jesus willingly allowed his body to be broken, that we remember when we partake of the bread, when Jesus willingly allowed his blood to be shed to pay the price of sin, all sin, all time, here's what happened. Please don't miss this. Jesus made possible for you to be reconciled to God. That the only way we can actually worship God in spirit and truth is because Jesus made a way for that. Jesus made a way for sin to no longer keep us from worshiping God. So when we partake of communion, we are acknowledging that and we're remembering that and we're thanking Jesus for doing that for us. But here's what I've also found. When you partake of communion, here's a really great prayer to pray from Psalm chapter 51. God, search my heart and know me. And reveal if there is any offensive way towards you. Can I challenge you as you partake of communion here in just a few moments to pray that prayer? I got searched my heart. Do an assessment of my heart. 
God, what is seated? The seat of the throne of my life. Is it you? Is it something else? Search me. Reveal if there's any offensive way. And I believe God is faithful to answer that prayer. And then what do you do? You confess. And, and might I suggest, church, that every time you worship corporately with God's people is an opportunity to pray that prayer. That every time you recognize I am worshiping a holy God, I was created in his image, and before I come into his presence and offer up my worship, I'm going to ask him to search my heart and reveal if there's anything that shouldn't be there. And I, as a part of this worship, I'm going to confess so that I'm a clean vessel as I come before him in worship. And so we're going to pray, and our worship team is going to lead us in a time of response. They're going to lead us into How Great Thou Art, the song that the title for this series was taken for. They're going to lead us into another song after that, so it's going to be a longer worship set. And as they lead us, you're going to have some freedom to move around this room. I'm not going to come back out and lead everybody into doing communion at the same time. You're going to be able to go get the elements. We've got stations down front. We've got stations in the middle. We've got stations in the back. And then at any point during this kind of worship set, which will be about seven or eight minutes, when you feel led, you can receive those elements. Now, you may want to go grab the elements with your spouse or with your family and find a quiet place here. You can kind of spread out in this room and, and maybe pray together before you do that. You may want to come down here and kneel at the altar. You, you've got some freedom to, to kind of move around and, and to perceive communion and, and participate in crying out to God and worship as you see fit. But the prayer I'm going to pray as we move into this time of response is that God does that for us. That he searches our hearts and he begins to reveal to us if there's anything other than him seated on the throne of our life. So would you join me as I pray that prayer this morning? And so God, that is my prayer. That as we enter into this time of response and as we enter into this time of remembering that you sacrificed your son for us on the cross, that you'd search our hearts. That God, you would reveal to us if there's anything else at the end of that trail other than you. And that, God, we'd be quick to confess that and to realign our heart's affection with you and to rightly respond in worship for who you are and to rightly respond in worship for being fearfully and wonderfully made in your image, made for you, made to bring praises to you. So, God, my prayer during this time is that you would just meet with each one of your children and that you would do business in each one of our hearts. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.